Hello and welcome back. We are talking about section 5.3 today, the definite, definite integral and the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it's got to be a big section when you've got words like fundamental theorem in there. Uh, here are our learning objectives. We're going to tackle just this first one today. So show how area under a curve can be expressed as the limit of a sum. So this will get, kind of get our feet wet here. Okay, so our first example, just to start things off, a uh, couple of parts, so two different functions for us to look at. First one, f of x equals 4 minus x. You might be more comfortable thinking of this as y equals 4 minus x, and that would help remind you of its graph, but this is a function with a constant slope, so it's going to be uh, linear. Uh, our task here is to find area, which isn't really a, a job that we've been doing so far in this class. Um, so it's interesting to bring in the geometry side of this. We're supposed to look between this graph, in other words, the, the, the line, the x-axis, so the horizontal axis, and then the, on, on the interval 0 to 4. So it turns out that's going to create a familiar shape for us. Task 2, which we'll come back to, once we've accomplished part A here is very similar. In fact, the equations are almost identical even. So 4 minus, but it's x squared. You probably recognize that uh, graph as a uh, parabola. So we'll have a very similar structure there, uh, kind of a more complicated area to compute. All right, so first up, uh, just reiterating that f of x equals 4 minus x really is linear. So its graph is a line. It's got a slope of negative 1, y is up to 4. There's a pretty little picture to go along with it, courtesy of Wolfram Alpha. Um, so there's our graph. And b before I sort of scroll onward here, we might notice, so there's the y-intercept of at, at y equals 4. Um, and you recall that the interval we're supposed to look over has x values going between 0 and 4. So that's basically going to get us right to the point where this graph touches the, the x-axis. And then, so if we're looking underneath the graph between 0 and the x-axis up to 4, we're going to get a familiar shape. That's just a triangle there. So what's nice about that is we're trying to find area, and it turns out we know a lot about how to find the area of that particular shape, the area of a triangle. So area of a triangle, uh, if you know the base and the height, that is the, the vertical distance, the height, the base would be some horizontal distance. Uh, in this case, they're each equal to 4, and the area of a triangle in general looks like 1 half base times height. So there's our kind of traditional setup. And then uh, base of 4, height of 4, so half of 16 would give us 8 square units. And, and we should feel pretty good about this. I mean, you might be questioning why we're asking about area, and that's a perfectly reasonable concern to have. But um, regardless of our, our motivation here, we should feel pretty good about having the exact value, the exact area underneath that line and above the x-axis on the interval that was given to us. So moving to part B and, and thinking about the, the picture that we're working with, we've got a parabola that has a y-intercept up at x equals, uh, sorry, y equals 4. And uh, you might recall our interval is a little bit different, but it's actually the same motivation as the one we just ran into. We're looking for essentially where it hits the x-axis. So out, out at x equals 2 is where we stop looking. Uh, we're going to use the, the graph on the interval from 0 to 2 above the x-axis. So uh, if I could sort of shade stuff in here to, to give us an idea of what we're up to. Um, here's, our, here's our basic stuff in, in my typical second grade scrawl here. So that area doesn't really fit a particular geometric formula that we've got. I mean, we can call it sort of a parabolic, uh, you know, cornered square or something weird like that. But there, we, if you think back to your, your high school or middle school geometry classes, there weren't any formulas for areas under parabolas. Um, so this, you can picture this happening for a lot of different formulas. We're not going to run into lines all the time. We're going to run into other interesting stuff. So our best strategy, at least for the moment, is to use some other familiar shape that we do have geometric formulas for computing. So in, in this case, we're going to use arguably the simplest one, uh, rectangles. Um, and it's kind of up to us how many of these to use. I think there will be an argument that things get better the more rectangles we use. We're going to go with four of them just as a starting point. And just to, to illustrate, we're trying to compute the area under this curve. Rectangles are necessarily flat. I mean, that's part of their definition. So if we start by using the height right at x equals 0, uh, we're going to get a rectangle that looks something like this. So uh, we're going to try to fit four rectangles between 0 and 2. So each rectangle is going to have a width of about one half unit. 
So here's our first rectangle with half a unit of width, and then the height that's equal to whatever the height is on our function there. I think it's, I think we should be convinced that it's four. Um, but you notice there's this, if we're trying to figure out area underneath this parabola, it does mostly a good job. And until you get up to this outer edge where the parabola kind of has this extra space, uh, it cuts off and then the rectangle has this extra space above and beyond. So this rectangle is going to have slightly more area than this segment underneath the parabola it, it really is due. Um, but let's keep going so we can squeeze another rectangle in there. So here's our second one, also of width 0.5. Uh, it has a height equal to whatever f of 0.5 is, the height of the parabola at x equals 1 half. And again, this one does an even worse job because there's all this extra area above the parabola that its rectangle is computing for area, but it doesn't really belong there. It, only, it should really stop as soon as we hit this purple edge. So then we've got our last two rectangles. Uh, we're going to hit at x equals 1 and x equals 1 and a half. And uh, so these, the sum of these four rectangular areas are going to give us some approximation for what's actually underneath this parabola. So if you're feeling skeptical about this, kudos. <laughs> you should be feeling a little worried about the accuracy of this um, because there's all this extra area in these rectangles that's going to be accounted and not part of what we're really trying to count, which would be just the area underneath that part of the curve. So uh, let's, let's do that computation regardless. I promise we're going to get to better stuff, better, better means of tackling this. So we've got four rectangular areas to compute. Each rectangle, uh, rectangular area looks like base times height. So I've just put some subscripts on here. Here are base and height of rectangle one, rectangle two, rectangle three, rectangle four. Um, so the first one has a width of 0.5 and a height of four. So its area is one half times four. The next one has also a width of a half times the height of 3.75. And remember, we're getting these numbers from the formula for uh, this, this parabola. So by default, we're grabbing all of these values from 4 minus x squared. And so if you plug in 0.5 into this, x, into this formula, uh, hopefully you're going to get 3.75 just like me. Last two rectangles, again, still a width of a half. This one has a height of 3 instead because 4 minus one squared. We're using the x equals one to compute that height. And then our very last triangle is situated at x equals one and a half, and it's got a height of 1.75. So all these things added together ought to give us the area of basically these blue solid figures, the interiors of these rectangles added together. So 6.25. All right, that's a quick calculation. Um, I guess it's worth kind of taking a step back. So this is saying, great, the approximate area under this curve is, under this parabola, is 3.625 square units. Um, uh, yeah, but we shouldn't feel great about that being a perfect uh, idea of what the actual area under that parabola is. We know it's, it's clearly flawed. The rectangles clearly incorporate more area than is actually under the curve. So we should, we should feel confident in saying, yeah, look, this, this is an, an overestimate. We've got more area than is really part of this figure. So one strategy that we could work with, or at least propose, is what if we used more rectangles? So still within that zero to two X value range, but instead we used, you know, 10 or 20 rectangles. We didn't do that here because that creates a lot more work for us, but you could imagine if we uh, increase the number of rectangles, each one would get narrower, they'd be thinner rectangles, so there'd be less error in how much area they were accumulating. So here's a definition that kind of gives us a sense of what's going on, and, and I'm going to just say off the bat, if this looks a little intimidating, then, you know, that's, that's okay. I, I, I get it. We'll, we'll piece through this kind of bit by bit. Um, so one thing to consider here is uh, there's some limit stuff going on, and there's a lot of conditions on our function, and it's going to be continuous, it's going to be non-negative. We've got an interval of x values from a to b. Um, but basically, I want to try to convince you that this is saying that the actual area under the curve, so for instance, if we think back to this parabola argument, the real area under that parabola is the limit of the areas of these rectangles as we add more and more rectangles. So, so that's what this limit thing is here. N is the number of rectangles. We're gonna, we could call those subdivisions. So number of rectangles. Um, and the rest of this is basically accounting for each of the little pieces of these rectangles. So one of the things that's kind of challenging initially is, is 
piecing out how this actually looks like something to do with rectangles. But here's the thing. Um, all the way out to the end of this is uh, the, the consistent piece for each of these rectangles. This delta x thing, uh, there's the capital Greek letter delta. If you're, any of you are in Greek life, then that's already very familiar to you, I imagine. Um, so, but delta x is, uh, delta in general in mathematics is often used to refer to some kind of change. Uh, so in this case, the, the, what we're referring to the change in the x values is just a width. It's the, the, the horizontal width of each of these uh, rectangles that we're using to measure. And because we're using, like with the parabola example, we're saying let's make each of them the same width, just for simplicity. Uh, they were, this delta x thing was 0.5 when we were working with our parabola example a minute ago. So each of the rectangles was half a unit wide. And then what was different between them was that the heights depended on the function outputs. So each of these things in here is the actual height of the, rect the individual rectangle we're looking at. Those in general are different, right? The parabola kind of fell to the right as we went. But each one of these outputs represents the height of the function on that graph that we measured. So if you take height times width, plus height times width, plus height times width, plus height times width, for however many rectangles you've got, these represent the area of the rectangles. If you increase the number of rectangles essentially without bound, what you get is the actual area. So this notion of increasing the number of rectangles increases the accuracy of your measurement. That's essentially what we're saying. Um, the rest of this is a little bit hard. I mean, so this is very typical in mathematics, but, but it's hard to kind of piece together the formality of this. This is just saying, look, if you picked one of these rectangles to look at, one of these little spots in line, um, then uh, this is the, the, the jth spot, the, the jth rectangle or subinterval, um, and that this is giving us a way to compute each of the, the widths. So yeah, remember B and A are the, the end points of this interval. So if you figure out the entire width across the interval, how far it is from A to B, and you divide it up into N equal pieces, each of those pieces will be B minus A over N wide. So there's just a, an easy formula for, for delta X. But again, these are just the, the widths. These are the same as we had up here. Just a convenient way to write each one. Whew. So weighty stuff. We'll come back in the next video and we will do some stuff with uh, uh, connecting this to the actual anti-differentiation strategies uh, that you've been using so far in the course.